So who am I? I'm uh, Steve Wong. Uh, I'm an open source software engineer. I work for a team that we call the Code Team, and it's funded by Dell Technologies. Um, we're software engineers who are assigned to work on community open source projects. In the past two years, I personally have been working a lot on DCOS and Kubernetes uh, Mesos. Uh, I added the storage interface for external volume mounts to Apache, the Apache Mesos project. That would be the DVDI isolator. And I've been active on the Kubernetes storage SIG for about two years. Um, my group code also maintains an Apache licensed open source project called Rexray. Um, it's designed to support Docker volume uh, driver mounts on multiple container runtimes as well as multiple container orchestrators. And uh, we're also off active in the container storage interface initiative that is underway. What I'm going to talk about today is just a brief intro to the history of the containers and the, uh, the 12 factors. Uh, then moving on, I'm going to cover container orchestrators and uh, pass platforms, platform as a service. Um, I'm going to cover orchestrator support for stateful services. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up with basically the first three are going to cover the state of running stateful inside containers. And I'll wrap up with a call to action on what you can do to get involved with Stateful now. Uh, we'll start with a history lesson on containers. Uh, some of these dates vary. I went and tried to research this, and some of these came out to be plus or minus a year. I think the difference is maybe when somebody wrote the first commit in a repository to when it became available to the general public. but. Uh, you know, don't throw stones if you know more than I do and I'm off by a year here. They should be pretty close. And the point here is that containers aren't really new. You can get traces of them all the way back to 1979 and the old AT&T Unix V7. Um, containers moved on into the first decade of the year 2000. Um, uh, Google released process containers, and these later became packaged into the Linux kernel as control groups, or also known as C groups. Uh, after these initial containers, a movement evolved uh, to support what was called platform as a service. And this was a movement that was designed to simplify the effort to deploy, build, run, and manage applications by giving you a foundation of ready-to-run components so that you didn't worry about networks, operating systems, middleware, servers, storage, and backing services such as databases. Uh, these were fundamentally based on containers, uh, whether they you know, uh, drilled down and explained it to you or not. Now, the advantage of these platform as a service uh, offerings were that you could reduce complexity and thus effort because much of that infrastructure comes pre-configured and abstracted behind something with automated management. The disadvantage of these past platforms is that you have reduced flexibility to support, to select the exact tools that you want. You know, in many cases, these platform as a service uh, offerings are opinionated and they picked the tool the tool solution, so once it's picked, you live with it. Um, some of these past platforms also face charges of having single vendor lock-in. Uh, finally, about a year after this cluster of past platforms come, came out, uh, this set of uh, patterns and anti-patterns called the 12 factors was published by An Adam Wiggins. He was a co-founder of Heroku which one could say I think is the pioneering pass platform, although when I did a Google search, it turned out that there maybe were as many as 10 of these. It's just some of them perished and are no longer with us. Uh, so I, I don't really know what it looked like at the time because I wasn't dealing with pass, but this is, this is what my research told me. And the, the 12 factors, uh, 
uh, were designed to abstract out the platform your app ran on. They used containers, and they supported horizontal scale-out of apps using container technology. Uh, what were the 12 factors, or what are the 12 factors that, that the, the website hosting this is still alive and well? Uh, they were a collection of patterns intended really to guide deployment of apps on the Heroku platform, uh, but they applied, I, I would contend, equally well on the other past platforms, uh, such as Cloud Foundry. Uh, where did this come about uh, in terms of modern containers, Docker? Well, it turns out that the 12 factors were published in 2011, and Docker didn't come out until 2013. It, in fact, was a spin-off of the 2011 dot cloud you see on that diagram. Um, the container orchestrators uh, depends on which one. The Mesos container orchestrator actually predates uh, the 12 factors, although it wasn't running at the time on uh, Docker containers. It, ha it had its own Mesos containerizer uh, based on Linux containers, and they added support for Docker later. Uh, Swarm and Kubernetes clearly came after the 12 factors. Um, now, what is the difference? I mean, we've got Mesos, Kubernetes, Swarm as container orchestrators and uh, uh, these past platforms. And really, I would use this analogy of comparing them to pizza as a service. You've got there in the two columns delivery pizza and frozen pizza. Now, if you get the delivery pizza, that, that I would contend is the equivalent of POS where more of the choices are made for you. You know, you deal with uh, uh, the vendor takes care of the cheese, the toppings, the pizza sauce, the pizza dough, the oven, the electric and gas, and uh, shows up at your door and you're done. You don't get to pick the oven, that, that's taken care of. When you go to the frozen pizza, it's using your oven and gas, and you maybe have a little more choice. If you liked it extra crispy, you're in control of your own oven. If you wanted to throw a few extra veggies on top of that frozen pizza, have at it. Now, this is the whole continuum of this. You know, to, to do this right, in this talk, I'm, I'm really talking about the, the 12 factors relating to pass and container orchestrators relating to containers. But the fact is, parallel to this, you could draw even more columns covering uh, infrastructure as a service, virtualization, uh, even running on bare metal, and the more, you know, in this continuum horizontally, you'd uh, deal with a less opinionated provider of service all the way down to potentially the equivalent of pizza of growing your own wheat, you know, threshing it, uh, growing your own tomatoes. And really, I would contend in IT, you have all of these choices, but the, the modern trend it seems to be that in many organizations, you're trying to eliminate this complexity, which eliminates your operational expense. Now, it isn't to say you have to choose one or the other. There are many organizations where one division might have things going on that make sense to run on infrastructure as a service, another one on uh, con a container orchestrator, and a third on pass. Um, but that's how I would compare these two. You're, you're basically, uh, you're basically in an arena where the past platforms make more choices for you, but because of that, they remove options from you. Um, what do the 12 factors say? Well, the one I'm going to talk about today is factor number six. It says, execute the app as one or more stateless platform processes. Why would they say that? Well, it's pretty easy. If you, if you have a stateless process, whether it's in a container or on a pass in a container. They're easy to replace and upgrade. You just shoot them in the head and bring up another one. Um, it's easy to automate scale up and scale down because there's nothing you care about inside these things if you've maintained statelessness. Now, on the other hand, uh, I, love this, I love this quote that somebody tweeted out there, uh, and it says there's Stateless is a hoax. I mean, if you take the aerial view, you can't go out there with a story that literally everything is stateless. I mean, somewhere if you're gonna build a useful 
useful app. It can't be something that has Alzheimer's every time the power goes out or you shut it down. I mean, so that state's got to live somewhere. And uh, this person's contention is that there is actually no such thing as a stateless architecture. It, it's just declaring that the state part, the difficult part, is someone else's problem. It doesn't make the problem go away. Now, in this picture, if you can see it in the background, they used an ostrich with a head in, its sand, in the head in the sand. Uh, I'd suggest that maybe a more appropriate animal analogy would be to use the elephant. You know, the, there's still state there on these past platforms. Um, Heroku, for example, or Cloud Foundry, they don't really eliminate it. They just declare that, and I've got it here, that any data that needs to persist must be stored in a stateful backing service. Well, that's where your state is. You've just declared it out of scope, the other guy's problem, but the elephant in the room is that it's still there and you're pretending you don't see it. Um, what exactly is one of these stateful backing services? Well, in the era when the 12 factors were originally written, 2011, it was typically a database. And the 12 factors goes on to advise that this database or this stateful backing service should be consumed behind an API, such as an HTTP network service. Now, what exactly would that be? Well, if you're running in AWS in the Amazon cloud, it would be something like Amazon's DynamoDB. If you're on-prem, it would be something like an Oracle database, something basically maintained by either your service provider or if you're dealing with the Oracle example, a team of Oracle DBAs, you know, high-priced experts that maintain this stateful backing service. Well, what's, that changes a little bit in modern times. I would contend that since 2011, some of these, it isn't just databases, it's moved on to various forms of NoSQL things like Cassandra, Mongo, Kafka, Redis keeping state uh, other than simply in memory, Elastic, uh, Hadoop. Uh, and what if you want to run these kinds of stateful services, but you're the guy responsible for your whole IT organization? In other words, suddenly it isn't the other guy's problem. You're the guy re maintaining that stateful backing ser service. Uh, there are perfectly valid reasons why you'd want to maintain your own too. Uh, maybe you want to pick the version of your own tool and, or database. Maybe you want to customize it. Maybe you want to stay portable across clouds. In other words, I want to put together an app that I could run on Amazon AWS, but also run it on the Google Cloud and also run it in certain geographic reason, regions in an on-prem data center. Uh, you know, in order to maintain that portability, you can't go use something like DynamoDB. You might want to pick an open source solution and uh, take management responsibility for it. Uh, another good reason for doing this yourself is to, main, to avoid database monoliths. The fact is, in a lot of those platform as a service solutions, the platform would stand up a database and Every app using it on that platform would be connected to that behind the, uh, the API. But ultimately, that results in a monolith where all of this information is in, in the one big basket. Well, what's the problem with monoliths? Well, uh, monoliths are bad for a, a number of reasons. Uh, if you let a database get large, how are you safely going to move, move it? You know, moving it to another location or a different version or a different technology can be as complex as rebuilding a 40-story high-rise in a dense urban area, where you're going to have to orchestrate an implosion with other buildings filled with people that you care about right next to it. The bottom line is, in my observation, and you know, I work for a technology vendor that's pretty big in storage. My observation is that once a database gets large, sufficiently large, nobody ever moves it. Nobody wants to bet their career on the risk involved with moving the, the you know, why is Oracle still here? Well, because the, 
there's a lot of really big ones, and nobody wants to bet their career on taking the risk of moving it. I mean, once these get large, that problem can be not just the risk of collateral damage and the, the time it will take and the outage where your services are off the air, but really these things can sometimes get so big that it, the problem is like moving all the water out of the Atlantic Ocean into the Pacific. It's just not doable with the technology you're likely to get, at hand, get on hand or with the budget that you're likely to have. Um, so just like people advise against monoliths when you're building you know, unrelated apps, whether they're related or not, you know, the whole principle of separation of concerns, I would contend that when it comes to data storage, it's a good idea to avoid these monoliths, that if two apps are not related, they shouldn't be saving their things in the same database. Uh, that gives you the flexibility to, to do things like pick different technologies when they make sense, and it keeps them from getting bigger so you can do things like change versions independently. I mean, consider the logistics if you had 100 different apps all in one database and then you want to update it. Uh, you're going to have to have 100 different teams responsible for those apps coordinate this effort to ascertain whether they're comfortable and compatible with this version change. Whereas if you kept these as separate instances of that data store, uh, you could do the common things like canary testing where you have one team, maybe one that uh, has a relatively low cost should it fail, go out there and do the testing for it first, and then, and only then, only if you have a satisfactory experience, let that ripple through to the rest of your organization. Um, you could also do things if you avoid monoliths of having a team with a key value store uh, that discovers a newer open source key value store that's likely to work better for them, have the freedom to upgrade without impacting others. I mean, and let's face it, in, in this field, things change all the time. The only constant is that things change. So avoiding these monoliths in your data store make a lot of sense. So if, if we agree that we want to give people the flexibilities offered in containers and container orchestrators, things like dev teams engaging in kind of their own self-service of picking their own tools, uh, taking advantage of container attributes like consistency no matter where you run, you know, looks the same whether you're on the Amazon cloud, the Google cloud, or on-prem. You want to have these things packaged with dependency management. Uh, you want to take advantage of an orchestration platform that can do health monitoring, automatic uh, rollouts and ro rollbacks, declarative configuration. Uh, putting these things in containers, if you can do it, makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of value here. So my wrap up on the 12 factors is that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not challenging the whole thing. I'm actually in full agreement that with the 12 factor principle uh, that publishing any, any data store behind an interface is a good idea, having a controlled abstraction layer. Uh, but I want one that's, I want to enable one that's hosted on a container orchestration platform that gets to cheat on that rule that all processes must be stateless. You know, they're, 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 maybe in 2011 that wasn't doable, but on a modern container orchestrator platform, uh, stateless running in containers is supported. And I'll, I'll, I'll go on a further slides to back that up if you have doubts. But by, by accepting the fact that maybe the 12 factors should be a little bit flexible, we can preserve its usefulness. And I mean, there are a lot of doc documents you know, in this technology field that should have a sell-by date of six months or a year. The fact is the 12 factors have survived from 2011 to 2017 pretty, pretty well. And a six-year life in any document in this field is pretty decent. Um, I'm not saying tear down the whole thing. I'm just saying we need to treat these 12 factors not like some religious codicil or treat them like a law book. And you'll just, you'll make yourself miserable doing that. They, 
they should be respected and considered when it makes sense. Um, now, if you're skeptical, oh, unfortunately, it looks like that's pretty hard to read. But what that is, just to point out that stateful in containers isn't new and isn't just crazy talk. This is a snapshot of Docker Hub. And it turns out that if you go to Docker Hub, you can actually sort these by popularity. In other words, the number of downloads. Well, on the day I got this, this is a top 12 list of images off of Docker Hub. And it turns out that seven of the top 12 on the day I looked were stateful applications. So pretty clearly, people are doing this. Uh, this isn't crazy talk. Uh, if we move on to container orchestrators, uh, we've got, this is a chart showing the features in uh, an assortment of container orchestrators related to running stateful, in stateful apps inside containers. So on the far left, you can see DCOS supports external volume, external persistent volume mounts. In fact, Kubernetes, Mesos, and Swarm do as well. DCOS and Mesos support frameworks. In other words, this is a two-level scheduler if you're, not, if you're not familiar with it. And they have frameworks that uh, have been published specifically to support stateful applications being managed on the platform uh, and uh, scheduled out onto cluster nodes. Uh, DCOS has packages to support uh, stateful apps uh, running in containers. Kubernetes has something pretty similar called Helm Charts. Kubernetes also has operators and stateful sets. And I'm going to go into these in detail. Um, now, you, on some forms of these stateful backing stores, it is possible to use local storage for state. But there's a downside to this. You know, my, what I would compare this to is I'd say that uh, you, know, you could you could be really crazy and run something like Postgres or MySQL on direct attached storage in a cluster node. But if you do that and the container is killed or that cluster node catches fire and burns, your data is gone, like forever. Uh, there are other things like Cassandra that do involve some forms of replication. So maybe you feel some pain when it goes down, but it, it might be recoverable. But I would use the analogy to using local storage to be like smoking a cigarette. You take that first drag, it tastes good at first, maybe you see other nodes doing it, but in the long run, it's going to learn, lead to shorter data life expectancy and reduce your capacity, your lung capacity. Um, the, the alternative of this is something called external volume mounts where you use uh, some sort of data communication, uh, network communication, to attach a storage volume that is provided off your cluster node. And these external volume mounts, how do they work? Well, they're, if you're a techie geek like me, you're probably familiar with the sci-fi TV series Star Trek. And I would say that a persistent volume, a persistent app using an external mount is just like that familiar episode of Star Trek. Your database binary can be like that guy in the red shirt. In other words, the expendable guy who you know, if you've watched many episodes, isn't going to ever be seen again. By the, t by the, by the end of that one hour episode, that red shirt guy is dead. Um, the, the stateful app binary can be the guy in the red shirt so long as you use an external volume mount, which is the guy in the yellow shirt. When trouble arises, the guy in the yellow shirt picks up the communicator and says, beam me up, Scotty. And he flees to safety. The red, the red shirt guys are dead. But the state, the stuff you cared about in your database, it got beamed up. You can beam it back down to another planet, pick some other red shirt guys, and you're back in business. Uh, if you're running things like Postgres, MySQL, the traditional relational databases, that is really how you're going to do it here. Um, there might be an alternative with some of them of sharding them, but you know, the baseline single node database, that's how you do it. Cassandra could take the red shirt guy getting knocked off, but in fact, in some instances, there might be benefits to using an external volume mount, even, if, even with cluster-aware storage 
uh, like Cassandra. This all depends, and I guess this is getting into a second talk that takes more than an hour, but I'd invite you to come and see me if you're curious about that, either after the talk or I'm hanging out in a booth we're sponsoring downstairs. But uh, uh, bottom line is, uh, external persistent volume mounts are like the Star Trek. It untethers your data from a particular cluster node and lets the container orchestrator do things like upgrade the database binary with a very short-term hit on, uh, on your downtime. And uh, it allows you to migrate things across these nodes so you could do things like a planned maintenance activity on a, on a compute node. Moving on to frameworks, like I said, all of the container orchestrators now support those external volume mounts. They're, they're, um, they've just become universal. Uh, the frameworks are found in Apache, Mesos, and DCOS. Now, these frameworks can support both stateful and stateless applications, but stateful app management is a primary use case, and Mesos frameworks exist for pretty much all of those stateful services I showed in that prior one. And at the end of my talk, I'll have a diagram that you can take with you that actually links to where you can find these. Um, the DCOS container orchestrator also has a concept of packages. And uh, on the stateful side, packages exist for Cassandra, Elastic, HDFS, Kafka, MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres, Redis, and even more. And this provides an App Store-like experience complete with a UI plus a CLI uh, for deploying these stateful apps. So they're basically moving this into the realm of the, the uh, easy button for deploying stateful. Um, Kubernetes, like DCOS has Helm charts, and it's a similar thing. Uh, an app store experience, it supports update and rollback of these stateful apps. Helm charts are available for Cassandra, Elastic, HDFS, Kafka, Mongo, MySQL, Postgres, Redis, and more, and it's growing. Um, Kubernetes also has a, 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 a recent addition called stateful sets. Now, it turns out with many of these cluster-aware scale-out things, like um, I don't know, Zookeeper, for example. Um, they're based on a horizontally scalable set of nodes that have unique network identifiers. In other words, they know that this guy is node one, this other guy is node two, and this other guy with this host name is node three. The stateful sets take care of separating out the configuration of these things uh, and, it, and keeping these running uh, using stateful persistent storage. The Kubernetes stateful set also manages, and this is very important in some of these cluster aware uh, replicating uh, stateful uh, solutions. It supports ordered startup and shutdown, uh, including a graceful shutdown where you might be able to drain transactions in progress uh, rather than have this be the equivalent of randomly pulling the plug on a bunch of servers. Um, some of these can recover in the unordered scenario, but it just takes a lot longer. And if you can have this scenario where you can shut them down gracefully, uh, if you're engaging in a planned maintenance activity and upgrade something like that, it's just a much more pleasant, reduced downtime experience. Um, finally, Kubernetes supports something called operators. And an operator we're getting into Kubernetes design here, but I'm gonna go for it. An operator is based on the Kubernetes controller concept. And in Kubernetes, a controller is something like the, you know, the thermostat that controls your furnace or air conditioner, where you start by setting or declaring a desired state, say 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And the controller is this continuous process that looks at what your desired state has been declared to be, goes out and takes a measurement of the current state and does what is necessary to maintain that condition. So uh, this, these controllers can take a declaration that I want X number of nodes of my horizontally scaled out uh, stateful solution and simply make it happen, 
health, monitoring the, health monitor this while it runs and engage in self-healing when things, should things go wrong. Um, an operator is free to be layered upon other Kubernetes concepts like stateful sets, external persistent volume mounts, et cetera, and they often are. Uh, but the bottom line is that Kubernetes has an inventory that is out there now and growing of operators specifically built to support stateful apps. Uh, if you want a demo of this, I've got two suggestions here. So tomorrow at 10.55, there's a session uh, which is a tutorial of running stateful applications on Kubernetes. And during this tutorial, which is going to involve Sada Lee of Google and Chris Duchesne of the code group that I work in, um, you're going to see a demo uh, deploying Stateful on Kubernetes, and it's an end-tier app using Stateful, and they're going to demonstrate first deploying it to the Google public cloud, and then deploying the same app unchanged to an on-prem uh, hardware scenario. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's actually user participation in this, so bring your laptop. Finally, if you're sticking around for MesosCon, there is a workshop on building your first stateful service on DCOS. So if this is a subject that interests you and you're potentially interested in either of these uh, container orchestrators, uh, I'd recommend these sessions. Uh, getting back to the 12 factors, uh, I'm not the first one to recognize the fact that as good as the 12 factors was, it perhaps is in, in need of some embellishment. It turns out that there's an O'Reilly book uh, that is excellent. In fact, some of the ideas for my presentation came from this book, as well as a presentation that I sat in at, at a meetup by Randall Schwartz, who is the MC of the Foss Weekly Show. And uh, at the end of my deck here, I'll show a link to, that will allow you to You'll have to give up your email, but you can download a free copy, a PDF of this O'Reilly book. And uh, it basically, uh, I'm making the point that the, the specific 12 factor line item that relates to Stateful maybe needs an update, but this book goes into more detail on other things of the 12 factors. And if you're deploying things on either a pass or a container orchestrator system, I recommend this book highly. Um, so is Stateful perfect on these container orchestrators? No, I'm, I'm gonna give you a warning up front that this is an active area, but there are, there are parts of this story of Stateful on, in containers, on container orchestrators that are ripe for improvement. Uh, the first one is backup. You know, to do backup right, you need solutions like um, Keying of these applications, and I mean the applications themselves, things like Postgres typically have a CLI you can call to drain transactions in progress and get them to flush caches in memory down to the storage level so that the storage can be utilized in a backup. But what you typically want to do in there is trigger a snapshot. I mean, in the old days in virtualization, that storage was evolved to the point where with popular storage solutions, they had built-in snapshot solutions where you just call an API saying snapshot this volume. Like that, the snapshot is retained, maybe in a copy on write scenario or something. But then the database can go back immediately into production and the, the outage related to a backup was typically minuscule and perhaps undetectable. You know, that, that snapshot made that instantaneous. Um, I am working in, with storage SIGs in both Mesos and Kubernetes, and I can tell you that these groups are working on support for snapshot now, but it isn't there today. So it's something, uh, that's something that's still in the air. Uh, uh, the second item is that Storage plugin drivers are not standardized against, across these platforms. Now, if you're a big organization that maybe 
is running multiple container orchestrators, and they're non-uniform. There are people out there who run one department in Mesos and a different one in Kubernetes, or one on a pla pass platform like Cloud Foundry and another on Apache Mesos. It'd be a great thing if this interface to the backing external volumes that you keep to store the persistent information was standardized, but they're not. There is an effort underway called the container storage interface that is a, a group of both orchestrator suppliers like Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker, Cloud Foundry, and storage providers like Dell, NetApp, um, a, a long list, who is working on this, but it isn't out there yet. So we're, we're having meetings, uh, we're designing it. My code group actually had the first release today of a provider for this container storage interface, but it's written against what is really a draft standard at this point. It hasn't been universally agreed to by this group, but we felt we had to go first, so we had a press release today announcing the fact that we came out there with uh, a, call, call it a validation suite for this principle of the container storage interface. And I would compare this contor container storage interface to the efforts like the container network interface um, uh, that, that have evolved in the container space to make things portable. And that work is underway. There are also some rough edges related to replication, volume resizing, et cetera, things that you've typically had available for years in the virtualization space. Um, we're still working on those on containers. Now, don't let that scare you. You know, I went there and told you the honest truth that some of these things aren't really comparable to what you might find with virtualization, maybe with some past platforms that run on top of virtualization. Uh, but I would contend that even though there are still some rough edges, if you're somebody who can make serious use of this, the time to get involved is not to wait till it's done, but get involved now. You know, the whole model of open source isn't like commercial software. I used to work in commercial software, and the way that worked is a product would typically have a product manager guy, a guy with that product manager title, who would try to deduce a feature list. Maybe he talks to the biggest customers, kind of asks them what he wants, goes off and builds things, and then comes down from the mountain with the product already carved out. Um, if that isn't to your liking, or if you want features later, it's typically you know, a long cycle to get what you really want in. If you get involved in an open source project like this today, while it's still forming, you're going to be in a position to actually contribute and basically get what you want. Uh, if, if you get a seat at that table and participate as an end user to represent your use cases. And I'm kind of sitting on the other side building you know, the implementation of this, but uh, I can tell you from the meetings that we've got and things like the Kubernetes storage thing that we'd love to have more user involvement representing your use cases so that we can build the things that people are actually likely to use. The other benefit you'd get of participating on that level before it's fully baked is that the bottom line is here that if you're really a big organization at scale, let's face it, you're gonna to need to have your staff or at least some members of your staff trained in this, right? To be able to troubleshoot this when things go wrong. Nothing is ever flawless. Well, I'll tell you, the, one of the best ways to get training would be to get there with a seat at the table as this thing is being architected and designed because you're, anybody who does that is truly gonna understand this from top to bottom. And if you do run into bugs, you're likely to build up contacts with the actual developers. You know, if, if some of these meetings are face-to-faces, some of them are on Google Hangouts or Zoom video calls, but you would get to know the actual developers, and I suspect that the net result of that is that if your organization uses this in mission-critical things, that you'd have, you'd, you'd have a, a contact list to where you could call these people, you'd know who they were, and, and they'd return your call. So 
I'd invite you to get involved if this is something that your organization is uh, potentially could, could benefit uh, from, and I'd invite you to get involved like now, before it's done. Uh, I want to get back, you know, to, uh, I, I'm going to suggest to you that the gestation of containers, you know, I showed you, I opened this talk with kind of the history of containers, showing that containers go all the way back to 1979. And they, they took a while to actually get adopted. I, I think that containers really didn't hit the mainstream until Docker came out myself. And I would compare this to the adoption of the automobile. It turns out that the first gasoline engine thing like an automobile, it was an engine attached to the push cart, came out in 1870. It wasn't until 1885 that Carl Benz made the first gas automobile for sale. That guy in 1870 just made that push cart for himself. And this was handmade, but you could order it. It was hand produced. Finally, in 1903, Henry Ford put together a factory to mass produce the Model T. Uh, now, let's see the effects of that. In 1900, before the Model T, this is New York City, Fifth Avenue. Believe it or not, those are all horses, but somewhere in there, in fact, it's right here, there's one automobile. So that's, that's, that's 1900 New York City. Just 13 years later, there's one horse in that picture, and it's all gone automobile. So a span of 13 years. Uh, you know, I would contend that this span uh, uh, took 34 years from that guy first building the hand push cart to when it got popularized. And this is very comparable to the development of C.H. Root in 1979, taking all the way till about now for containers to get mainstream. But when things move, they actually move pretty darn quickly. And this field of containers is moving quickly and stateful in containers is moving quickly as well. So I think that this, we're only a few years out before containers are universal for both stateless and stateful. And once again, to my point, this, this is why I think you should get involved now, even if it doesn't quite have things like the volume snapshots yet. Um, that's the end of my talk. I'm going to just show you a few things here because I'm gonna leave you with a link to this deck. But this is the Uber chart, uh, kind of, I raced through this, but this shows you the support for all the stateful apps on the various container orchestrators. And if you get this deck, this is actually a hyperlink that actually takes you to the repository and the documentation for what's going on there. So you can learn how to deploy these on the various container orchestrators. Um, if you wanna take a picture of this one, I've already published this deck uh, up on SlideShare, so this will get you to this deck. Uh, that top link is the free O'Reilly book on uh, the 12 factors revisited. I'll just leave that up for another second so you can get pictures of this. And I, I did release this to the Linux Foundation who should publish it in my experience. Uh, they'll get it in a couple weeks, but they generally publish them as PDFs, and I can't promise you that it will have working hyperlinks. So going here might be better. Um, finally, should you want to contact me, you can get me on Twitter at that handle. I unfortunately see now that these maybe aren't super readable, but this is the group I work for. We've got a booth down in the uh, expo hall, so come and see us. Um, that said, I guess I have room for some questions here, if anybody's got any. Yeah. So the way I read the 12 factor uh, set of principles uh -huh. earlier on was, okay, run, run your you know, stateless workloads in containers and then externalize them. You know, you're yeah. It, call it somebody else's problem. You know, at that time, maybe the approach was to run them either in, in bare metal environment or run them as virtual machines. Of course, you know, one problem which has been solved is you know, the ability to orchestrate stateful uh, set and you know, Right. What about running, you know, state, stateful sets in containers themselves? You know, 
I've been asking around and I haven't seen a lot of cases. Oh, that's what they do. They, yeah, they, yeah, but you know, are, are people actually running them in production? Apart from, of course, you know, the orchestration part or mounting a external volume so that, you know, if, if a container dies, you can mount it elsewhere and give it that handle to that person volume. Mm -hmm. that, apart from that, are there other, uh, other aspects which would prevent you to run stateful uh, sets in production in containers? Well, I... Okay, he's asking if people are actually using Kubernetes stateful sets to run stateful apps in production. It's not Isn't so it? much about uh, Kubernetes uh, stateful set orchestration. Containers themselves, when you run uh, run a state a stateful set in a container environment, you know, are there some some challenges which would prevent you to you know, do that, or would it lose some capabilities which would you would get in VMs or bare metal environment otherwise? Or well, I. I think that uh, there are people running it in production, but there's varying levels of tolerance, right? I mean, some people have more tolerance for failure than others. I, you know, it's so new that in some fields, like financial transactions, my gut feel is that those guys tend to be the last adopters of technology, and some others are much more aggressive. So it's been more of an issue of looking at each other, you know, who's the first person who can do it, and then uh, they will other yeah. not, not really a technology now, uh, issue. Now, on some of these, I think that it almost is required that they run in containers. So if you look at something like a big data, fast data solution like a Kafka, I think the reference platform for that is, in fact, running it on Apache, Mesos, or DCOS. That, you'd be really out of the mainstream if you were to stand those things out off of a platform like that. So um, I, I think a lot of this depends specifically on what the stateful app is. And a lot of it is your tolerance for pain. You know, the stuff isn't perfect yet. Some of these stateful solutions actually are cluster aware. So some of these could even be used without the external volume mounts using DAS but you would, you know, the downside of that is that if you get sufficiently big, like let's say you scale out horizontally to a thousand nodes, once you get to that size, my contention is you've almost you've always got some nodes in failure, right? I mean, the, the probabilities just creep up the bigger the size gets, and the That's logistics the of that, well. yeah. Okay. So. so well. It isn't perfect, let's put it that way. And, uh, but there are early adopters who are already going there, and a lot of it depends on what your stateful app is, and a lot of it, like I say, depends on your tolerance for pain. What will it cost you if there's a glitch, if I have to do a recovery from a backup if things go wrong? Uh, there, there's no universal yes, no. Uh, even in virtualization, which has been here I don't know how many decades. Um, I think if somebody told you it would never fail ever, they're a liar. I mean, this, this stuff maybe isn't as good as some of those other solutions, but it has other benefits. I mean, if you really want portability across clouds, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever tried to take a virtual machine running on-prem in one hypervisor and then move it in, <laughs> into the Amazon cloud and then move it back because uh, uh, my own experience with that is a conclusion that they're really not portable at all. <laughs> yeah, of course, you know, that's one problem container that I installed. So, yeah, you know, this maybe isn't as good as some solutions at some things, but it's way better at others. That, and you have to decide on your own which of these attributes is important to you. And I can see with all of the R&D effort and human manpower being invested in these open source projects. I mean, all of those things on that chart <laughs> have dozens, if not hundreds, of people behind them. And there's a lot of effort going into this stuff to, to, to build it up. And the world is going there. Uh, how, how, big is the how big is the practical size of the stateful sets at this point, with Kubernetes well, or Mesos, whatever is support, whatever applications? Um, I think that depends on the app too. I mean, there are some of these stateful apps. People build a stateful app for something like, um, I, I know there's a guy, uh, Josh Burkus, who's like a guru of Postgres, who's speaking here. And he's the, 
If you're curious about running Postgres, it would be a sharded Postgres uh, database server on Stateful set. He's the guy writing it. So I think I'd suggest that maybe you have to ask that question in the context of the specific Stateful app you're trying to run, because the answer is different for all of them. And some of them are in a more advanced condition than others. Um, Oh, I even, I just noticed Saad is here, so he's somewhat of an authority on Kubernetes too. Do you have anything to, I hate to put the spot, but maybe you can contribute to my answer there. Uh, I mean, at least from the Kubernetes side of things, um, we're very new. Kubernetes has been around for two years. That said, there are uh, fairly large deployments out there. Uh, it's a lot like what Steve said, depends on what your tolerance for failure is. If you need to be very, very, very highly available. Uh, trying brand new cutting edge, te edge technology probably isn't uh, where you want to go. But at this point, I think, at least from the Kubernetes side of things, we're fairly stable. Um, it's uh, far better than it was when we started about a year, year and a half ago. So people are trying it out. We do have uh, customers deploying stateful applications using Kubernetes. Um, so it's, it's definitely possible. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you for coming.